Good morning, good morning, good morning. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord our God. Our feet have been standing within thy gates, O Jerusalem. Good morning. We are elated and delighted that you have decided to join us this morning as we seek to worship God on this annual lay day. We look forward to our speaker for the hour and just are grateful for another day to serve the Lord our God. Are grateful for another day to be in the, not the physical house of the Lord, but to be present in the spirit to be present in the spirit in the place of the Lord our God. And so we're grateful and thankful for you being here, your presence being here both on the platform, the Zoom platform, as well as at home or online on Facebook and YouTube. And we now are gonna enter into a moment of praise and worship where we can just prepare our hearts and our minds uh, for, for the service, for this service. Um, and so we're gonna turn it over to our tech um, and then we'll be back with the prayer and scripture.
Amen. Truly, our God is worthy to be praised. Amen. Let us go to God with the word of prayer. Eternal and all wise God, we've gathered on this Zoom platform this first Sunday of Advent, this fifth Sunday of November to first and foremost say thank you. God, we say thank you for the gift of this day, for it is a day like none other and a day that we'll never see again. But God, it is a day filled with your goodness. It's a day filled with your grace, a day filled with your mercy and a day filled with your love. Gracious and all wise God, we give you honor, glory and praise for the opportunity to worship you in spirit and in truth. God, we thank you for the opportunity to experience your Holy Spirit and your presence power. God, we thank you for the opportunity to just see yet again another day. God, for keeping us throughout last night, for keeping us throughout another week. God, for keeping us throughout the holiday season, we say thank you. God, when we could have lost our mind, when we should have lost our mind, when we could have lost the things and the people precious to us, God, you kept us and you kept them. And for that, Lord, we say thank you. Father God, we ask right now that you forgive us of our shortcomings and of our sins, of things both done and left undone that have been unpleasing in your sight. Gracious and all wise, God, we ask right now for a double portion of your Holy Spirit this morning on this Zoom platform. We pray and ask, dear Lord, that right now in the name of Jesus the Christ, the name that heals, the name that delivers, the name that restores, the name in which we hope and in which we look forward to, in that name, we ask, dear God, that you would be with us in this worship service. God, we pray right now for our speaker right now that you would be with him as he brings forth a word of challenge and encouragement to remind us, dear God, of what we have, to remind us of who we are and remind us of who we've been called to be. Father God, we pray for each and every family represented on this Zoom platform, each and every family that is connected to Turner's Chapel, each and every family, dear Lord, that has been served, dear God, over this past week. We pray for them, believing, dear God, that you are in the process of doing the impossible. You are in the process of doing the unimaginable. You are in the process of doing the unthinkable by finite minds. God, we are so grateful. We are so grateful for every, every ounce of blessing that God, you've bestowed upon us on this day and in the days before. Father God, may this worship be pleasing in your sight. God, may it be pleasing in your sight. In the name of Jesus the Christ, we do pray who is our savior, who is our Lord, and thanks be to God, is our returning redeemer. In his name and in his power, we do pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Amen. At this time, we will have our opening hymn, followed by scripture and our Advent lesson.
Amen. Amen. Our scripture this morning is coming from Isaiah, the 64th chapter, verses 1 through 9. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence. As when fire kindles brushwood and fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways, but you are angry and we sinned. Because you hid yourself, we transgress. We have all become like one who is unclean and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our father. We are the clay and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O oh Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider we are all your people. The word of God for us, the people of God, thanks be to God. Our Advent reading this morning reads as follows. If ever there was a year we needed Advent, this is the year. We hardly know how to describe the year we have lived through. We hesitate to reflect on all the mess around us in 2020. All we know is that nothing seems right Nothing seems like it used to be, nothing. We need Advent. The prophet Isaiah cried out for us, oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down to make your name known so that nations might tremble at your presence. So tear through the mess, O oh Lord, and come down to us again. We long to be your people, a people of hope. We light this first candle as a sign of our hope. Hope that you can meet us, even in the mess of our world. Hope that you still see us, though we feel lost in the rubble. Let this light be the guide that brings us to Emmanuel once more. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and rescue captive Israel. Amen and amen. Again, we thank you and welcome you this morning to Turner's Chapel AME Church Virtual Worship Experience. We are so grateful, so delighted, so happy, so elated that you are with us this morning. We count it not robbery because you could have been a number of places, but thanks be to God when you woke up this morning, God started you on your way. God gave you the activity of your limbs. God gave you strength in your body, God gave you food on your table, clothed you in your right mind, a reasonable portion of your health and your strength, and you decided to be with us this morning. Truly, we thank you and we thank God for you. We are definitely this year in for a treat as our speaker, uh, attorney and brother, Chavis Jones has a word for us this morning. And so I want to, at this time, uh, offer unto you the opportunity to give unto this ministry here at Turner's Chapel, African Methodist Episcopal Church, located in High Point, North Carolina, 27265. If you would, you can go on right on over to our Givelify page, Turner's Chapel, Amy Church in High Point, and bless this ministry that we might be a blessing to those in the community. We were so grateful and so so ecstatic to have our soup kitchen serve this past Thanksgiving day, um, serving the community on Washington Street. We're so grateful for that opportunity to serve and, and that God allowed us to touch the lives of so many during this season. And so we ask that your gifts, the gifts that you give make this ministry possible, 
they make and help us to do ministry, not only in High Point, but throughout the world. And so we ask right now that you would, that whatever the Lord has laid on your heart during this time, you would go right over to give the fire and give unto the ministry. Amen and amen. We thank you for your liberal giving and pray that God will pour back into your lap a hundredfold of what you have so richly and bountifully blessed the Lord's church, the Lord's ministry with. Amen and amen. At this time, we're going to have our introduction of the speaker. I'm going to uh, read his bio and then give you a little bit of my own personal take of, of this dear brother. Chavis Jones is a proud graduate of Morehouse College, where he studied philosophy. Chavis then obtained a Master of Divinity concentrating in religion and social ethics from Harvard Divinity School. At Harvard, he was a fellow of the Harvard Graduate School Leadership Institute, a staff writer for the Harvard Journal of Human Rights Policy, and a ministry fellow. Earlier this year, he graduated from the Duke University School of Law, where he focused primarily on civil and human rights issues. He was the president of the Duke Black Graduate and Professional Student Association, worked as an active investigations team member of the Duke Law Innocence Project, and currently serves as, a national as the national vice president of the Duke Black Alumni Association. He plans to ultimately use his education and life experiences to advance causes of human rights and to connect the human family. I had the pleasure and opportunity of meeting uh, Chavis while we were both at Duke, uh, at Duke University. And um, this is just one solid brother. When I tell you he is both, uh, he speaks and walks his truth. Uh, I'm grateful to have him, grateful to know him in my life, grateful to cross paths with him. He did so much to serve the community, um, both locally and abroad, um, that the list, it, it goes well beyond the, res the resume that was read. But I'm grateful for his service. I'm grateful for his heart, grateful for his humility, um, and in the ways in which he uplifts the community wherever he finds himself. So after we have our selection, uh, our sermonic selection, the next voice that you will hear will be none other this is a brother that is going places. And I want us to be, I'm grateful that he decided and thought it not robbery to stop by here at Turner's Chapel to be with us on this morning for our annual lay day service. Truly want to recognize the lay this morning and all that they do for the church and the kingdom of God. Um, there would not be a church if it were not for the lay. There would not be a church if it were not for the lay. I'm gonna say it one more time for the Holy Ghost. There would not be a church if it were not for the lay and the lay organization. And so we are so grateful for all of the work that they do both locally as well as on the conference level to our very own president, Sister Valerie Murphy for what she does and, and that committee, that executive committee, we give God thanks. Um, we are so grateful for all that they do and look forward to what they should, what they shall do and what they shall be in the coming years. Um, and so without any further ado, we're going to have our sermonic selection. And after that, you will hear the speaker of the hour, Brother Chavis Jones. Prepare your hearts for him. <laughs> Oh 
know my story All the things that I've been through You can't feel my pain What I had to go through To get here You never understand my praise Don't try to figure it out Can you all see me? Yes, we can see you. All right. Let us go to God in prayer. God, we thank you and we love you. We praise you for your goodness towards us. God, we're reminded of the words of the elders who would often thank you that last night was indeed not their last night. They would thank you that the sheets that kept them warm throughout the night were indeed not their winding sheets and, and that their beds were not their cooling boards, but they thanked you for every single day because they understood that not just the holiday, but every day was a day of Thanksgiving. And so God, we come to you with Thanksgiving in our hearts and praise on our lips to just say thank you one more time. We thank you, O oh wise God, for, for being ever so kind to us that you would tiptoe across our lives this morning and say, I want you to live just one more day. 
We thank you, God, for giving us breath, for giving us life, for giving us a reasonable portion of our right minds, and for God allowing us to run on and see what the end would be. For we know that 2020 has been difficult, that we've experienced pandemic and racism and transitions that haven't always been so peaceful, God. We've, we've endured leadership that has not always reflected the best of your kingdom, God. We've endured so many things in this year, but as the songwriter reminded us, we've been through too much not to worship you. And so wise and eternal father, our God, we bless you on today for the love that you give us that allows us to endure it all, for the peace that streams through our lives like ever flowing rivers, for the love that engulfs us in our lowest hours, for the hand that wipes every one of our tears when we need you most. We thank you, God, for being an ever-present help in the time of need. And so now, a oh wise God, I pray that as I speak to your people, that they would have ears to hear, that their hearts would be open to the word, and that, God, you would use them to do a mighty work in your kingdom, that even amidst a pandemic, when the world has shuttered in place, when the world has seemingly been put on pause, that you still have ministry for them to do. That even without a title, even without obligations to a ministry, that God, you have work inside of them, that they might be ministers to the world. God, use your people, that they might bring about a mighty change to disrupt the world as it is, to bring broken people back together, to bring divided people back together, to change an America that is deeply divided to be the anchors of the best of your spirit in this world. God, let us be anchors of the very presence and spirit of God. And we'll be ever so careful to give your name all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. In the name of that carpenter, in the name of the one from Galilee, in the name of the one who changes situations, who raises dead things back to life, we give your name praise in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm so delighted to be with you all, Turner Chapel, uh, AME Church, and to be with my, my brother, uh, Reverend Kendall McBroom, who is a brother beloved, who is an extraordinary leader, um, who on the campus of Duke University was so visible uh, in, in my time there. When I got there, he had already been there for a year, and I could tell that his imprint was deep on the campus. And so I want you all to to truly thank God for your leader and to bless God for him. So if you can comment on Facebook or on the Zoom, just comment with some thanks to God for the leader that is Kendall McBroom. If you could clap on your videos or clap where you are at home for the leader that you have in Mr. Kendall McBroom, he is an extraordinary, extraordinary leader who is indeed, as he said about me, who was going extraordinary places. And so you'll want to, to watch as God uses God's hand to bless Kendall McBroom. So we thank God for him. Now for a word of scripture, I'm gonna be reading from the book of Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, the sixth chapter, beginning with the 10th verse, the book of Ephesians, the sixth chapter, beginning with the 10th verse, and we're gonna to go to verse 20. So uh, I'm gonna read from the NIV, but you can read it in any version that you have before you. And it reads in this way. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in God's mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take stand against the schemes of evil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And in addition to this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit 
on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all of God's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. The key verse, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against spiritual forces of wickedness in high places. I wanna to speak today from this thought, how to fight an invisible enemy. How to fight an invisible enemy. Beloved, beautiful children of God, it was in December of last year, nearly a year ago, that a cluster of people in the Hubei province of China, in the sprawling city of Wuhan, which has 11, 000, 11 million rather citizens, in the, in the city of Wuhan, that a cluster of people started to develop the same flu-like symptoms. They weren't sure what was happening to these people as they became sick and they would begin to wheeze and their bodies began to ache and they had all of the symptoms of the flu, but there was something different about this when it, it, was, it was stronger. And as we would know just a month later, the World Health, Health Organization, the WHO, would declare an international health emergency for a virus that would become known as COVID-19. Just two months later, we would have one of the worst pandemics this world has ever known. We all remember where we were in March of this year, almost nine months ago, over nine months ago, when we realized that the whole world was fighting an invisible enemy. We started fighting the virus that many didn't know what to do with. People started shuttering themselves in place and we were not yet aware that we were supposed to wear masks, but we had started washing our hands vigorously and and we stopped going out in public as often. People were concerned about the elderly and people with underlying conditions because we knew that this was an enemy that we could not see. So much has happened since then. And as the world has grappled with this incredibly dangerous illness, 62 plus million people have now contracted the COVID-19 virus. And that's that we're aware of, 62 plus million people. And throughout our world, over 1.5 million deaths have happened as a result of COVID-19. On American soil alone, we've had 13 million people contract this virus. And now we're approaching 270,000 people who have died because of COVID-19. We're fighting an invisible enemy. They told us to follow the three W's. The CDC said that we should wear our masks, that we should wash our hands and that we should watch our distance. So much has been done to, to tell us how to fight this invisible enemy. But in spite of that, we've watched as millions of people have contracted this virus and thousands upon thousands have died. Reports are that companies like Moderna and Pfizer and the University of Oxford have discovered virus uh, vaccines that can potentially cure at a 95% or more rate. But yet and still, here we are, almost at the end of a year 2020, and we're still fighting an enemy that we cannot see. That's not the only enemy we faced this last year of 2020, this crazy year of 2020, but at the beginning of the year, we watched as individuals like George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor and so many nameless other Black people died at the hands of, of vigilante justice and 
and as a result of another invisible enemy, a belief, a system of the mind that we cannot see this all across America called racism. As we walk down the streets, we're not aware always of the folks who are racist just by looking at them, but, but there's something invisible in, in American society that, that you can't always see. It's, it's an invisible illness that has physical manifestations. You, it's an invisible illness called racism that kills people physically, that people of black skin have been dealing with since 1619. We have been fighting both a visible and an invisible enemy. This country has been dealing with, with so many things that we can't even describe to future generations that all of this happened in, in one year. We wouldn't know how to describe it, that all of this happened in one year. In 2020, so many deaths, so many celebrities have left us. Kobe Bryant left at the beginning of this year and so many other celebrities. We have dealt with a crazy year, political tensions, a president who refuses to concede his power we're dealing with a lot of invisible enemies, things that we cannot see. But the beautiful thing is that we, as children of God, have been equipped to fight invisible enemies. For the scripture says that we'd wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and authorities and spiritual wickedness in high places. We, we've seen spiritual wickedness in a high place. We, we've seen spiritual wickedness in the highest of places. We wrestle with principalities and we have a mandate because our battle is not primarily with people, but it's with powers. Our battle is not with a single soul, but it's with spirits. Our wrestling is not with a single person, but with systemic powers that we cannot see. And as those who believe and Jesus the Christ, as those who have chosen to take up the mantle of Christians who serve an invisible God, who, who deal in the invisible, who pray and, and believe in spirits of good and evil, who understand that in this world there are things beyond that which you cannot see. We have an obligation as lay to deal with that which we cannot see while everybody else is wrestling with how are we going to make it? With poor leadership, how are we going to make it? with a pandemic, how are we going to make it with violence on the rise against black bodies and, and so many other things happening that are at stake in this particular year? We have a solution. And that is to be the people of God. And so I have three quick points and I'll get out of your way. The first point is this, our enemies aren't always visible. Our enemies are not always visible. As children of God, we understand that sometimes you can walk in a room and you can just sense that there's something dark about the room, that, that people might be just sitting at a table and you can feel a spirit, you can feel a darkness hovering over the room, that you can be watching someone on television and see something beyond what they're saying, that, that you can see evil spirits operating in the minds of people as they speak before uh, those on the television, that we have a different vision of the world, or at least we should, that we should be able to see that which the rest of the world cannot see. For our wrestle is not with faces. Our wrestles is not with the occupant of the White House. Yes, we talk about him a lot, but there are spirits beyond him that permeate our world, that we have to be the very vanguards of, that we are required to be the very spirit of God here on earth that fights against that which seeks to devour, that seeks to conquer, that seeks to steal, kill, and destroy. As you read verse 12, it gives you some solutions for dealing with invisible enemies. It says, therefore, put on the full armor of God. So when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place and your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. That's what we have. We, we not only should be wearing a mask in this season, but we should be wearing the full armor of God. 
People ought to be able to see you and see something different. They ought to see everybody else panicking and, and see some, some strange peace about you. They ought to be able to say that this person has a peace that surpasses all understanding, that it doesn't make sense that when we're on the job and everyone else is, is troubled and worried, that, that this person has a wisdom to understand that even though I'm concerned, I'm not worried. There's a difference to know that we must take care to, to do everything that's required, to, that faith without works is dead, that we should do the work, but we should also have faith that we should wear our masks, but we should also pray to God who protects us even, even when we're in situations where we are protecting ourselves. And that as we wrestle with evil in this world, that we shouldn't be just following the pundits, that as we watch CNN, we shouldn't just be upset with everything that comes out of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue every day, that with each Supreme Court nominee, that with each horrible statement that he makes about Mexicans saying that they're rapists and thugs or, or calling women pigs or, or talking down about African Americans or speaking to a political climate that is divisive and, and speaking to wanting to take his country back. When black people know that this country was never good for us, he's claiming that he wants to make America great again. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that in the times that they're speaking to, it was never great for us. But in spite of that, people ought to be able to look at you. As the scripture says that you ought to let your light so shine among men and women that people might see your good works, but glorify a God who is in heaven. They ought to see something different. You ought to have such a prayer lifestyle. You ought to have such a biblical lifestyle. You ought to be so entrenched in the Bible and in, in the word and in spirit and in the goodness of God that when people encounter you, they say, I must, I must be encountering one of those Christians they talk about. You know how the old folks were, how our grandparents and great grandparents were, there was something different about them. They had such a, a prayerful mindset. They, they loved God in a way that permeated every aspect of their lives. They prayed about big things and little things. They prayed about everything from a bill to a, finding a parking space at the, at the mall. They prayed about every little thing. And that's what the scripture commands us to do. Our second point is this. In times like these, you have to reach for God. It's been said that when people's lives are off balance, they, they, they reach for something that if you're falling you'll you'll always reach for something and in this world where people are dealing with unemployment at unprecedented levels and in this world where people are dying all around us and in, in our families and people are dealing with coronavirus in this world you better believe that right now as people's lives are off balance they're reaching for something whether that's alcohol or, or drugs or whether that's uh reaching for, for things that'll take their minds off of their situation in the wrong people and in the wrong places. People are reaching for something. And when your life is off balance, you child of God better find a way to reach for the everlasting God. The old folks said, hold to his hand, God's unchanging hand. They said, time is filled with with swift transition, not on earth unmoved can stand, but we should build our hopes on things eternal and hold to God's unchanging hand. Child of God, you ought to find God's hand in this season and hold tight to it. That even while you're crying tears at night, even while you're struggling to know where the next paycheck is coming from and, and how your bills will get paid or how your body will get better when it's stricken with pain, that you ought to hold to God's hand knowing that there is a God who cares deeply about you. You ought to hold to his hand. And children of God, please learn that we have to pray. Verse 16 says, in addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. 
Pray for everything. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. If you have not developed a prayer life in 2020, with all of the things that are going on around you, you ought to start right now. This is a perfect time that when you get off of this service, you find a consecrated space in your home, whether it's a closet or a room that nobody goes in, whether it's the bathroom, that you find a place to get on your knees. And if you can't kneel, that you find a place to pray because that's the only thing that's gonna protect you from the invisible enemies that we face, not COVID-19, but the invisible evils that confront us every single day in life, that if you do not find a way to pray, the nightmares of this world have a way of taking all of your dreams. The nightmares of this world have a way of engulfing you in darkness, that if you aren't reminded that there's a God beyond all of your trouble, that this world has a way of getting you alone and by yourself, Many scholars have said that in this year, 2020, the opioid crisis is facing up to, that there have been more people dying of opiate deaths and, and drug-related deaths that, indeed, what I said earlier, that when people's lives are off balance, they're gonna reach for something. And, and what we found is that COVID isn't the only thing keeping killing people right now, but people are dying from drugs and dying from, from the violence inflicted on their bodies, from taking in too much alcohol and too much of drugs. They're trying to self-medicate. But the elders reminded us that there's a balm in Gilead to heal your sin sick soul. There's a balm for the soothing of the nations that when you need it most. The elder said that what a friend we have in Jesus. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Privilege is a prayer. Prayer is a privilege. It is an opportunity to take your burdens and be reminded that we have a friend in Jesus who sees all about your trouble and knows all about it. And we forfeit that privilege every time we refuse to take our burdens to God, big and small, from every little thing to every big thing that we have, we have to take them all to God. When we do not, we disrespect God because we say that this is too big for you to handle and I'll try to handle it on my own. So trust God and continue to pray. Our third point is this, that in this season of great darkness in this world, it's a requirement that we be the church. This morning and all over America, people are gathering on Zoom and on Facebook Live and on YouTube to be in church. They're not in physical buildings, at least I hope not yet. Or if they are, I hope they're gathering in small numbers. But unlike ever before, for the last nine months or more, people have been gathering remotely. We've been worshiping God while not being connected to one another. And now more than ever, we had to learn that the church is not the building, but the church is us. That we don't need a praise and worship leader if we haven't been praising and worshiping Monday through Saturday, that we don't need a word on Sunday if we haven't been cracking open that Bible and putting some highlights on those pages in the morning and in the evening and talking to God about everything that he's revealed to us through scripture, that we're required in this season to be the church. Verse 18 says, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for this. Watch this. Keep on praying for all the Lord's people. And that's a tough mandate, children of God, that you got to pray for everybody. That you got to pray for not only the neighbors that you do like, but the, the enemies that you don't like. You got to pray for people that are close to you on the job, and you got to pray for the occupant of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. You got to pray for people who have lifestyles like yours and those who don't. People who you agree with and those you disagree with. We have a requirement from scripture, not from the pastor, not from the preacher, but from scripture that we got to pray for all of God's people. That's what's required in this season, that, that if the world is going to know that there's a bomb in Gilead, you're going to have to show them what that bomb looks like. That if the world is going to know that there's a peace that surpasses all understanding, you're going to have to be that peace. 
that if somebody needs prayer from the pastor and they can't get to them, you're going to have to be the person that prays for them. That if someone who is elderly has no one come by their home all week long and they're struggling with isolation, that you need to drive by and wave through the window. That if someone is naked or hungry or not in their right mind that we should give them clothes or food or pray for them or get them the services that they need. That in this time, the church, my God, has to be the church. That we have to be like the church that Jesus was, one who walked among all of the hills of the Galilee, seeing about the people, sitting amongst the sinners, being with those who were drunkards and those who, who were not of the church and sitting with him. And when, when the priests saw this, they scoffed at Jesus. Why are you sitting among those who drink and get drunk? He was doing the work of God. We have to be reminded to, that to evangelize doesn't necessarily mean to bring somebody to a church, but it means to bring the gospel to them, the good news that there is a God who can do something about your trouble, that the world needs to know that evil doesn't have the last word. And I'm gonna close with this a, a story that reminds us that we have to hold on to, to God. A few years ago in 2014, a young man named Willie Myrick, who was about five or six years old, was, was in front of his grandmother's house in Atlanta, playing by himself when he was suddenly kidnapped. For the next three hours, that young man would ride all over Atlanta in the car of his kidnapper not knowing what he would do with him, a, a small young man. I'm sure he was worried, wondering where his grandmother was to take care of him. As he went through the drive, this young man began to sing a song, and this is a true story. He started to sing a song. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with one accord. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with one accord. And he kept singing this song and the driver, the kidnapper started cursing at him. Young man, be quiet. Young man, shut up. Young man, I'm gonna kill you. And for the next three hours, they kept on driving and the boy kept on singing. Every praise is to our God. He sang this song over and over again. And I'm, I'm sure his grandmother had played this song so many mornings that it was in his spirit. Every praise is to our God. And at the end of the third hour, the kidnapper got so, so angry, so upset that he put the little boy out of his car and said, don't you tell anybody I kidnapped you, but I can't take your singing anymore. Little Willie was reunited with his grandmother and she was so happy. A little while later, he was able to meet Pastor Hezekiah Walker who created that song. And as he, as he spoke about his experience, he said, I just kept singing until he let me go. I tell you this story to tell you that 2020 has taken us through so many things. It's, it's taken us out of character. It's taken us out of our sense of comfort. It's taken us to places that we did not want to go. But if you hold on to a song of God, he'll keep you in the midst of being kidnapped by this world. He'll keep you in all of the darkness that you see. He'll keep you and God will find a way to... Uh, to alleviate all of your pain and your suffering and release you from the pains of this world if you hold to a song. I said that was our last story, but I have one more story. And another point. I'm reminded that God does some of God's best work in the dark. God does some of God's best work in the dark. I once read the story of a young man who grew up years ago in the middle of a ghetto. He grew up in a minority community to a teen mother in a blue collar family. His dad was a carpenter and did the best he could and, and tried to, to do some work around the community. And the little boy had dreams of doing big things. And he was one of those kinds of kids that wanted to save the world. You know, he wanted to change the world. He saw how his parents were living and he wanted something better. The little boy would grow up and he would be a carpenter just like his dad. But somewhere around the age of, of 30, he started to have a dream and 
He started telling people about this dream and he decided to quit his job and to pursue this dream full time. As he started to tell people about this dream, they, they mocked him and looked at him and wondered why would he tell them that? They, they said like they told uh, Joseph in scripture, let's kill this dreamer and see what becomes of his dream. He told them in this dream that if you destroy his temple in three days, he would raise it up. He told them in this dream that if he be lifted up, he would draw all people unto him. He told him in this dream that if I leave, behold, I'll leave a comforter to take care of you. And because of this dream, they decided to take that dreamer and put him on an old rugged cross. They took that dreamer and they beat him all the way up the Via Della Rosa as a crowd yelled out, crucify him, crucify him crucify him. It was a dark moment and he stood on that cross as he died of asphyxiation and, and his body began to shut down and he could no longer breathe and, and it was a terribly dark moment. As he drew his last breaths, he would cry out to his God, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He said to God, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was on that, that old rugged cross all Friday. They would put him in a tomb and not a plot. He didn't have a headstone. He didn't have his name engraved on it, but they put him in a borrowed tomb. He would stay there all day Saturday. It was a dark situation in that tomb. For all of the hopes of, of a generation, 42 burning generations were in that tomb. It was a dark moment in that tomb because all of our salvation was was in that tomb, people who had followed him, 5,000 people who he gave bread and fish had followed him and wondered how could our dreams and hopes all be in that tomb? Two women came the next day to see about this dreamer. And when they opened the tomb, they discovered that he was not there. Why? Because he had gotten up. And on the third day early that Sunday morning, he got up with all power in his hands. And I know it's a dark moment in America, but, but I want to tell you this morning that because Jesus got up, you can get up. Because of every situation that's going on in your life, don't get discouraged. Don't lean on drugs and alcohol and darkness and, and people who can't help you, but, but hold on to Jesus. And because he got up, your life can get up. I know it's a dark moment, but, but I reminded you earlier that God does God's best work in the dark. That it's in the darkness of your life that God finds a way to create things. That just like in the dark womb of a mother, God creates some of the best things in the dark. So just as you cry those tears, just as you sleep alone, God reminds us that God does his best work in the dark. So don't ever be discouraged. Don't ever be dismayed. Know that God is with you even until the ends of the earth. And God will keep you even in a dark moment like 2020, even amid a pandemic like the coronavirus, even among racism and economic depression, God will keep you so that you can tell the world about a gospel and about a savior who lives. And because he lives, tell them, lay of Turner's chapel, lay in me, tell the world that because he lives, you can face tomorrow. Tell them that he will walk with you and he'll talk with you and he'll tell you that you're his own and the joy that you'll share as you tarry there, no other has ever known. You're never alone and God loves you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen, wow. Wow, we thank God for the word and the messenger. Um, how to fight an invisible enemy. If there was ever a time when we needed to hear a word such as this, um, such as today, it would be now. It would be now. We needed to be reminded that God has already given us the tools in Christ Jesus. Um, God has already given us the tools as lay and as clergy to fight this enemy that we, to fight these enemies, uh, rather, these invisible enemies that we are up against. And so we give God thanks for you, Brother Chavis, for being here with us. 
and for allowing God to use you in such a powerful way this morning to provide us with um, a much needed and an awesome word truly from God. And so we give God thanks for you and pray that God will continue to keep God's hand upon you as you venture out into the many things that you do for the kingdom um, and for not only this nation, but for the world and generations to come. So we pray God's blessings. At this time, we want to extend extend uh, the invitation to walk with this dreamer, to live with this dreamer, to do life with this dreamer, to have a relationship with this dreamer whose name is Christ Jesus. We extend now, if you would like to give your life to Christ, if you would like to take up this journey, simply just drop your name or, or a, a drop that I want to uh, obtain salvation on today. Believe it in your heart, confess it with your mouth that Christ Jesus was raised from the dead and you shall be saved. And while that is the beginning of the work, um, there is now a family, uh, you will be a part of a family of believers, a family of fellow dreamers who are now walking in a dark world, but realize that though weeping may endure for the night, God's joy is going to come in the morning. So we extend that opportunity to you on today, that relationship with Christ Jesus on today. Amen. Amen. At this time, we're going to enter into a, a moment of prayer, and then we'll have Brother Chavis come back and give us a benediction. Would like to ask um, that you would keep, I believe Sister Diane mentioned earlier that she had a death in her family um, in Sunday school. And so I ask that you would keep her family in your prayers. Um, also keep the family of Reverend Tashara Void in your prayers. She lost her nephew this morning in a car accident. Um, and so we want to keep them lifted, keep them lifted. We give God thanks. We give God thanks um, for the recovery and the steady recovery of uh, Brother Reggie and, and others that have contracted or that have had COVID. And we give God thanks for that. Good to see them on the line today. Um, also want to lift up Sister Diana Simmons as this is her last Sunday in North Carolina. Um, her last Sunday in North Carolina, and today is her birthday. Today is her birthday, so we wish her a happy, happy birthday as she gets ready to make a transition back to Ohio. Um, we give God thanks for her ministry and her work um, and just the joy that she has been to work with here at Turner's Chapel. So if you get a chance today, send her a line, give her a ring to tell her happy birthday, um, to let her know that she is loved. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Ever wise and eternal God, we give you thanks for the gift of today. God, we are thankful for the awesome, powerful word that we received this morning that reminded us and let us know that we are up against invisible enemies. But God, you have given us the power. You have given us the tools. You have given us the skill set to fight these enemies head on. God, in scripture, you tell us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in high places. And dear God, you tell us and remind us to put on the full armor of God, dear Lord, so that we might be able to fight that which lies ahead of us. God, we're thankful for the messenger and the speaker on this morning. God, we're thankful for his spirit and thankful for, dear Lord, the things that you are doing in his life and through his life. God, we're grateful for the word that is brought on today and are grateful, dear Lord, that it did not fall on hard hearts or deaf ears, but rather, God, that we would be doers and activators of this word here in the space and the time that we find ourselves. God, the world needs us to fight the good fight. The world needs us to not grow weary, weary in well-doing. God, the world needs more of you and your spirit. And God, help us to be your hands and your feet and your mouthpieces as we seek to live life and seek to be about your kingdom. God, we pray right now for Sister Diane's family, 
asking right now that you would cover and keep them during this day. And God, in the journey, the journey of grief, God, we continue to lift up Sister Landa Peterkin and her family, asking right now that you would wrap your loving arms around her, reminding her that you have not left her, nor will you forsake her. Father God, we lift up all of those who have come in contact with COVID, as well as who have overcome COVID. We pray their blessings, dear God. We pray grace and mercy upon them. And God, we thank you for their testimony. God, we're thankful for Sister Diana Simmons and allowing her to celebrate another year on this side. God, we give you all the honor, the glory, and the praise. We pray, dear Lord, now that you would continue to use us as your people to be about liberation, to be about hope. God, we're thankful for the hope that this season, this Advent brings to us. That in the dark times and in the dark days and in the dark years of our existence, your light shines through. Your hope shines through. Reminding us, dear God, that we can make it. Reminding us, dear God, that we can press our way if we continue to hold to your unchanging hand. So God, during this Advent season, we pray for a revival. We pray for the reminder, dear God, of what each Advent Sunday provides for us, about what your son, Jesus Christ, provides for us. And God, we'll be so ever sure and certain to give your name, the honor, the glory, and the praise, which you so richly and so rightly deserve. Be with us as we enter into this last month of the year. Turn around what needs to be turned around. Strengthen us where we need to be strengthened. Keep us where we need to be kept. Restore us where there is loss. And ignite within us a fire that looks forward. Not to just the buzz of the holiday, the music, the caroling, the, 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 the decorations and all of those things. But God, the true heart and true soul and true spirit of Christmas. May it rest, rule, and abide in our hearts and our minds as we feast on hope on today. It's in Christ Jesus' name we do pray and do praise. Amen and amen. Amen, amen. Again, we thank you for visiting with us this morning. We thank you for being present with us this morning, for worshiping with us this morning. I want to acknowledge the presence of our uh if, if she's on, I didn't know if she might have any words that she would like to give. Um, our, our lay president, I, I don't think she's on the Zoom. I think she's watching from Facebook. But I also know that our conference president was on earlier. And so we want to acknowledge her presence, uh, Sister Penny Oliver. Thank you for being with us on today. And I'm going to turn it back over to Brother Chavis for, uh, for the benediction. Let us pray. God, we thank you for this service. We thank you for being the God of our comings and our goings. Now, God, as we go through this week, remind us that we face enemies that we cannot see, but you've equipped us to deal with them. Remind us, God, that when our lives are off balance, that we should not reach for bad things, but that, God, we should reach for you. Remind us, God, that in this season where the world so desperately needs light, that it's our opportunity for the church to be the church. And when darkness whirls all around us, when chaos overcomes our lives and we get down and worried and concerned and, and doubt clouds our minds, remind us that in these dark moments that you, God, do your best work in the dark. And as we go, keep us and remind us that we can trust you even when we can't see you. And it's in the name of Jesus, the one who walks with us, the one who talks with us. We praise your name for this service. In the name of the Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you all. Enjoy the remainder 
of your week. And may the Lord our God keep you in perfect peace. God bless.